Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guests today are Laura Lee McIntyre and Jennifer Feifler. Laura Lee McIntyre is the Interim Dean of the University of Oregon's College of Education, a Castle McIntosh Knight Professor, and Professor and Co-Director of the School Psychology Program. Professor McIntyre also directs the Prevention Science Institute. Jennifer Pfeiffer is a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. She co-directs the National Scientific Council on Adolescence and the Center for Translational Neuroscience. Professor Pfeiffer is also the director of the Developmental Social Neuroscience Lab. Professors McIntyre and Pfeiffer have been appointed to the faculty of UO's Bomber Institute for Children's Behavioral Health which was established by a gift from Connie and Steve Bomber on March 1st, 2022. Thank you both for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. Thanks for having us. So uh, both of you, tell us a bit about your backgrounds and what led to your uh, respective interests in childhood mental health. Sure, so I'll start. I, I'm trained as a developmental psychologist and cognitive neuroscientist. and. I became interested in adolescent well-being because it's this time of so many changes and transitions happening at once um, from their bodies and brains to their inner and outer social worlds. And so I study how these changes are related over time with adolescent mental health and well-being um, and decision making. And um, really importantly, I see adolescence as a period of incredible opportunity to set young people on positive lifelong trajectories. Um, even or maybe especially if they experienced adversity earlier in life. Laura Lee? A former preschool teacher. Uh, so I started out very early in my career as a preschool special education uh, teacher. And it became apparent to me very early on that uh, some behavioral support needs are just part of regular development. And then other children really require additional supports in order to be maximally effective in those environments. And so early on in my job as a, as a preschool teacher, I supported um, students and learners from a wide range of backgrounds with lots of different behavioral support needs. And what I learned pretty quickly is I didn't have all of the knowledge and tools to be effective in that role. I went on and got a PhD in school psychology. I kind of got bit by the research bug and um, really became interested in uh, supporting schools and teachers, but also families that supported those young learners. And um, like Jen said, she's interested in the period of, of adolescence as a really critical time to, to intervene and support. I'm interested in early childhood and those critical kind of early school transitions and um, the supports that we can provide to families and communities, but also teachers as they support those young learners in their development. So you've both been appointed as faculty to the new Bomber Institute. Tell us about what led to the founding of the Bomber Institute. How did that come about? Well, it seems so uh, perfect on paper now that we have the big splashy announcement. Uh, there is a little bit of a backstory and I'm not gonna share all of our industry secrets but I think really what uh, was so special about the founding of the Balmer Institute is it was born out of a true collaboration and partnership with faculty across campus in the College of Education and in the psychology department. And we realized our strengths um, in, in um, development, in child and adolescent development. We realized our strengths in prevention science um, and clinical interventions and we came together in a way that I, I think is important uh, for other faculty to see. We can do more when we work together. We are also currently, I don't think we're out of the woods yet, in a global pandemic. And we realize the impacts of the pandemic on children's behavioral and mental health, on teachers, on workforce. You know, people are leaving the workforce or burnout. And we realize that this is a problem in society that we could solve with um, the research, the motivation, and then of course the opportunity to work with some incredible donors who care deeply about these issues. So um, it was a true partnership in every sense of the word, but it was organically derived based on our desire across campus to really make a difference in the lives of children and adolescents here in the state of Oregon. 
Jen, you have anything to add to that? No, that was an incredible summary. I just think I love how Laura Lee highlighted that there were all, all of these different ingredients, right? You know, we had what was happening at the University of Oregon um, and what was happening around the state, around the world, and our partnerships, um, our support from Governor Brown and um, legislati legislative and um, educational and accrediting bodies. Like it, it was kind of this incredible alignment. Like everyone is saying, we, this is a need and we can do something about it. And I just, you know, without those, if any of those ingredients were missing, we probably wouldn't be where we are today. It's really a team effort, but of course we wouldn't be anywhere uh, without the visionary philanthropy of Connie and Steve Falmer. So you've already started to answer my next question, but what's unique about the Balmer Institute? What, what, what distinguishes it from other similar kinds of uh, efforts? Well, I think Jen and I probably, um, We'll touch on some of the same things about what make the Institute unique. From my perspective, what's unique about now and who and why is that the, the timing of this incredible gift and the timing of the Institute to address kind of the behavioral and mental health crisis is unique. So 10 years ago, we were talking about prevention, 20 years we were talking about prevention, now we're talking about prevention and intervention and care because we're in a crisis. And so I think what, what is unique is the timing. I'd also like to point out that what's unique here is it's a true partnership with, with many of the um, constituents and partners that Jen mentioned, but we are in a state, the state of Oregon, that came together in ways that are just not fathomable um, outside of you know, a small-ish size state. So the fact that we had our legislative body, the fact that we had our governor and an institution and the academic leadership coming out of the provost's office and faculty aligning with um, the passions of Connie and Steve Ballmer, I think makes it unique. We're also, um, as a research institution, not unique in our focus on research, but here this institute also focuses on workforce development and clinical service delivery in a meaningful way, not just an afterthought, but it's really baked into the recipe. And I'll stop because I'm sure Jen will, will identify other elements that are unique, but it, it is exciting and, and like no other um, institute or idea that I've ever experienced. Yeah, um, you know, when, when you say, you know, what's unique about the Balmer Institute? It's kind of like, well, how long is your show and how much detail do we want to get into? And I'll just add one, maybe sort of specific, because I feel like Laura Lee gave a really amazing overview of some of the just unique elements. But one of the things that um, we think is really unique is um, this opportunity, this, this undergraduate degree um, that we are developing. So there are really, really very few opportunities around the country, in fact, around the world to be trained as a licensed mental behavioral health professional at the bachelor's level. And that's a problem because it creates bottlenecks to services and care. Um, and so we really were thinking about this when, when all the groundwork was starting many, many months ago on this, um, this idea that, you know, at some point, the profession of nursing was developed, and that was actually born out of great need in society, out of out of war, and out of like real, you know, there were this there was this huge need, and um, we felt like there were some sort of analogies here to what we were going through as a society in this pandemic. That maybe again we would be able to see this alignment across sectors of everyone saying, hey, we need this so much that we're willing to think completely outside of the box, and we are going to kind of create this equivalent of. What are nurses in the medical system? And these are going to be trained child behavioral health professionals that can work in schools and other settings to um, promote healthy, positive use development and provide, um, you know, inner sort of preventative services and indicated care with, um, you know, when necessary. So we think that that, that that's just one of the things, um, one of the other elements that's so unique and exciting to us is um, how, innovative and creative that is. So unlike most of the institutes at the University of Oregon, this one will be housed in Portland. So tell us why, why, is that, why was that decision made? 
Well, we are certainly a state where we have uh, regions of the state that are very uh, low in population density, and the majority of our state's population is in Portland. Uh, as an institute and as a university, we're focused on providing services and care to those who are historically underserved, marginalized and minoritized communities, and that is in Portland. We were very committed to serving that kind of social justice need, but also being in the most populated region where we would have an opportunity to train a diverse workforce to serve the community and to partner with the community in ways that of course are needed across the state. The needs of rural Oregon are very different from the needs of uh, the metro, Portland metro area. And so we're sensitive to that. And we see that our work is centered in Portland that can be deployed across the state as we ramp up and scale up. And ultimately, we hope to have the Balmer Institute for Children's Behavioral Health serve as a national model. So although it is place-based in Portland, we see that as an important way to make a, a footprint and a forge a collaboration and partnership um, with Portland Public School. We also see these relationships um, uh, going across the state and then potentially nationwide. Yeah, I would just, you know, as as Laura Lee points out, Portland's the hub of the state and it provides the institute and faculty and trainees the chance to work directly in and with persistently underserved communities. Um, but, you know, again, our goal is not for the impact of Homer Institute to be confined to Portland, even just in the state of Oregon. There are over 1,200 public schools and almost 200 districts around Oregon. So over the years, we will be expanding our partnerships with districts and communities around the state. Um, in rural and indigenous communities, et cetera. And in particular, I think, you know, as mentioned, leveraging technology and other um, innovations to make participation in the institutes, things like the certificate and degree programs feasible for folks who are needed in their home communities. So tell us a little bit about how you imagine the Institute is gonna partner with these Oregon schools. We're starting our partnership efforts in Portland Public Schools Portland Public School is the largest school district in the state of Oregon. They also have been hit incredibly hard as have all public schools by the pandemic. And we're experiencing at record numbers, uh, teacher shortages. We're experiencing a shortage of mental and behavioral health support personnel. And so through a partnership with Portland Public School, we are able to co-create curriculum we are able to identify the needs of the largest district and, and bake in those needs into our certificate and undergraduate training program. And, and we can elaborate on those just a little bit. But we also um, have the, the benefit of having an elementary laboratory school right in our backyard um, in the new Balmer Institute campus, which is the former Concordia campus um, up in or so there's an incredible opportunity to engage in lab-based, you know, lab meaning uh, the school, lab-based training, practicum, supervision. We're hiring clinical faculty as part of the institute, and those clinical faculty will be in schools working with professionals, school-based professionals, on behalf of our certificate uh, enrollees and also our undergraduate students as they enter our program. And our clinical faculty will be housed in these uh, partnering schools and agencies and also deeply connected to the research and innovation um, heartbeat of the Balmer Institute. So it really is this symbiotic uh, collaboration where public schools are feeding us information about what the needs are, where the crisis points are, and then through uh, discussion and collaboration, we in the Institute are then meeting needs that can be across districts, but we're, we're really starting with PPS Portland Public Schools first, um, given the proximity to the Institute, as well as the, the magnitude or the scale of problems and issues that all K-12 um, settings are experiencing. So Jen, why don't you tell us about these uh, the the degree programs that you're imagining? How how these students are going to be trained and what they'll be trained to do? 
Well, Paul, I can say that this, uh, you know, I can, I'll, I'll begin to give a, a synopsis of it, but it's actually what we're actively working on now. That's what Balmer faculty are doing. Um, this is not something, this is not something where you're taking like an undergraduate major like psychology or family and human services that are currently already at the University of Oregon and just picking them up and you know, plucking them up and plopping them down in Portland, that's not going to work because that's not what we're training for. So, um, you know, this is an iterative process where we have um, um, meetings with um, stakeholders, with folks in the community. There are multiple meetings per week with um, Portland public school staff um, to kind of align what we're training with, as Laura said, what the greatest needs are and also be mindful of the fact that this is not like, you know, when I say we're trying to train nurses, there, there are many other, um, you know, there are many other individuals located in schools that are providing all kinds of supports. There are mental health professionals, there are school counselors and psychologists and social workers. And we're, we have to be mindful about how this new um, profession interacts with them and sort of is unique from, is distinct from and complementary to, and so we, to, to what they do. And so we have been um, honing in on developing a scope of practice that ranges from universal, universal pro, uh, pro health promotion programs to um, more, you know, sort of targeted um, prevention type programs. And then, you know, probably it, the sort of most, um, in, you know, sort of could take the most intense training, but also, you know, and is really important, but might be a smaller fraction of their day-to-day -day efforts is really well, well um, circumscribed areas where they can provide indicated care um, to, to uh, children or adolescents that are um, experiencing kind of already escalating, you know, mental and behavioral health problems. So we've talked about the scope of practice and program objectives, and we're, we're honing those in and refining those and have processes in place to be developing these through stakeholder input and through public comment. Um, and, and then from that flow, the develop flows, the development of the actual curriculum and the course objectives. And so all of that is unfolding now. That's work that had to be started, could only be started really after the launch of the Institute, because you, you, you need to do this in partnership with all the other stakeholders. And so um, hopefully that gives a sense for the flavor of it. I would also say that it's a um, being envisioned as sort of a two plus two program. So um, the focus of what, what the undergrad degree will do is these sort of two intensive years at the Balmer Institute involving um, uh, dedicated coursework to these program objectives, but also um, clinical training, heavily um, placements and practica in the schools. Um, and so they're going to they're going to be multiple pathways into that two year program, um, both um, from the University of Oregon and also from other um, community colleges um, around the state. And we think that that's really important, and we're very excited about that. Are you imagining that there's going to be graduate? degrees as well as undergrad degrees? Not, you know, that's not the initial focus, um, you know, in the future, that might be really, really exciting. And I think um, they're, that we're excited about that. But right now, the focus is on the um, certificates for educators and other qualified mental health professionals that are already working in school systems, as well as the degree program, the bachelor, uh, bachelor's degree. And, um, and that current graduate um, students, for example, at the University of Oregon, will have opportunities to sort of, um, you know, interact and be involved with the Balmer Institute because they can be involved in sort of these, these hierarchies of training and supervision as they already currently are here um, in Eugene. Put a little plug in for our school psychology graduate program. So it's separate from the Balmer Institute. But we've recently expanded that program to include, starting this fall, a Portland-based cohort. And so I, I think that you know Jen's point about our focus on undergraduate and then a certificate program for professionals who are licensed and currently serving children, either in schools or other agencies, is really good. It sets us apart. It makes us unique. We're able to serve the needs of child serving professionals right away through a certificate program, providing additional knowledge and skills, supervision and applied um, and supervised activities for those professionals. We're launching that first. 
Meanwhile, we're developing the undergraduate curriculum. You know, Paul, that uh, to develop curriculum and to move things through our curriculum process at the University of Oregon uh, does not happen overnight. And there is a series of, you know, very lengthy processes involved in that. So, so the undergraduate has a later launch. But we also recognize that there are graduate programs that we currently have here in psychology, in school psychology, in um, child and family therapy, in um, school, school psychology, special education, you know, our current sort of lineup of graduate programs that prepare licensed professionals. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity to expand and grow the reach, but the need of the workforce truly is at that undergraduate level we simply cannot prepare enough masters or doctoral level mental health professionals, psychologists, social workers, counselors to meet the need. Um, so I, I think that's really why we focused in on workforce development at the undergraduate level and certificate training. We can see the most return our, on our investment there. And of course, we're already in the business of um, doctoral and level education. So tell me, um, you mentioned the clinical faculty that you will be hiring. So tell us about what, what you're imagining those clinical faculty, who they are, where they're coming from, what they're going to do. Those are great questions. Uh, our, you know, our plan is to hire 15 clinical faculty. We have funding for an incredible 25 new faculty, 15 of whom are clinical faculty. We will engage in national searches for these clinical faculty. So as clinical faculty, they are career track faculty who engage in applied work, training, supervision, and applied research who are baked into our programs of research, but primarily um, uh, their, their jobs involve instruction and clinical supervision that is place-based in child serving agencies and schools. And so the backgrounds of these clinical faculty could be, um, you know, anyone who has experience and expertise in evidence-based prevention, care, and treatment, um, family-centered interventions, working within communities that have been historically underserved. Of course, we are looking to diversify our faculty. We are looking to diversify our students that we serve because we can be maximally effective when we're preparing a diverse workforce for a diverse community. And so I would imagine that these clinical faculty have a range of backgrounds, but the common denominator, that common theme is that they are involved in clinical care, prevention, treatment, intervention, systems level work that involves um, promoting the behavioral health and mental health of children and youth. So um, your dream for the impacts of the, of the Institute, how is the Institute, when it's fully up and running and it's well-established, how is it going to positively impact children's behavioral health in the Portland area and then in the state of Oregon? Well, I think, you know, we expect that because of the nature of these um, placements and and the model that we're developing that will have an immediate impact on increasing the capacity of schools to deliver universal health promotion strategies like social emotional learning programs more targeted preventative services you know like anti-bullying programs and well-defined cases support um, other qualified mental health professionals and in providing indicated care. So we'll like it'll be this immediate increase, you know, to, to help meet the immediate needs. Um, but I think what one of the other excited things we're so excited about that Laura Lee mentioned is that this is all happening in this cycle of innovation, a reinforcing cycle of innovation that the research and the clinical practice will um, will will inform each other in a way that allows us to scale up the services we're training we want to train and increase this um this pipeline of uh, a diverse um, culturally rich workforce and also we always recognize that we still can't solve this um we can't promote healthy youth development alone by um 
expecting that there will be sort of one-on-one -on -one care all the time or one-on-one -on -one service provision. So we're thinking a lot about how do we scale up um, things like leveraging digital technology to increase the reach of programs and interventions and training these individuals to work with those new technologies and see and then so so you have and then you have them out there in the schools working in these placements and and kind of refining in that iterative cycle so we see it as both immediate and then you know Im immediate impact and then amplified impact over time would also add that we are looking for a model that's sustainable and so with an institute that is endowed this is not a five-year grant that when it runs out, all of the resources in the communities go away, that this is a scalable model, but we also are working with our legislators to determine how this can be funded and how the behavioral health specialists, our new undergraduate workforce that we're developing, how they can be employed and how those services can be built. Because it is critical that as we address the workforce shortage, we're thinking long-term about how these can receive federal sources of funding through Medicaid and other, other programming and other resources. So it's, it's part of our service delivery model. It's not a one-time unique to Oregon model. Um, we're building it for our future. And so we can anticipate what the needs are right now, but as we develop our curriculum, our workforce planning, our supervision, our cycle of innovation, we are thinking, uh, we're forward thinking to identify what the needs will be 10, 20 years from now and funding and sustainability is critical. We met with um, some of our, uh, we met with our two US senators a couple of weeks ago who demonstrated deep commitment for financing our efforts and thinking about how federal policy can inform how we finance our efforts. So there's incredible enthusiasm about what we're doing here in Oregon and what we're developing. But I think in order for us to be successful, we need to make sure that there are workforce pathways and a funding stream that can support this model outside of our partnerships with Portland Public School and other districts that we partner with. I think um, at that point we'll be maximally successful. Of course, we wanna also identify through our research new models of prevention and intervention that will have an impact on children and families. So you mentioned that um, eventually you will hire 25 new faculty. How many students do you think will go through the program each year? How many, how large is the impact that you will make through the new students that you will train? Yeah, so once, you know, our initial target for once uh, the undergrad degree program is up and running fully is that the cohorts will have 200, um, we'll graduate 200 bachelor's level professionals a year. Um, of course, there'll probably be a little bit of a ramp up period here, um, but that's that's sort of our hope. And then as Laura Lee mentioned, I think what's so exciting about this again is with these partners, um, with legislators and thinking about this, uh, thinking about the sustainability of, the, of this is that we can also scale up further. We can hire more clinical faculty and train more um, bachelor's level professionals if those as those models get established. Um, so, but that's our initial starting um, starting point. So um, we're coming to the end of our time. This is gonna be my last question. How soon do you predict the Bomber Institute will be doing the work that it's supposed to do? Laura is laughing. <laughs> we have the most ambitious of timelines. Um, we're in a crisis situation, so this, this problem cannot wait to be solved. And so we are launching our certificate program this fall. And I say that, and I do not believe the words coming out of my mouth right now. We are working in earnest to launch our certificate program. That's non-degree, that's a non-degree bearing uh, program. We can launch that faster. But as Jen mentioned, we're developing the curriculum and the undergraduate program now, and we're, um, we are planning to launch that in fall of 2023. So we will take the next year and a half to, to develop and uh, deploy this uh, curriculum to the, the necessary constituents and groups for a 2023 launch. And I say that 
And I hope that, and we've got uh, everyone in the state of Oregon that's been a part of the Institute and the development kind of rooting for us. And so it, it definitely is a sprint at this point. You have other things that you do. I, I, uh, I wish you all the luck. I guess you won't be doing a lot of sleeping in the next two years. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for talking with us and telling us about the new Bomber Institute. Um, it's just been a fascinating uh, conversation and such an important project that you're engaged with. We wish you all the luck. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. I've been speaking with Laura Lee McIntyre and Jennifer Pfeiffer, faculty of the University of Oregon's Bomber Institute for Children's Behavioral Health, which was established by a gift from Connie and Steve Bomber on March 1st, 2022. Thanks so much for watching.